Good morning. My name is uh, Xavier Koitkin. Uh, I'm a neuroendocrine tumor surgeon at the University of Chicago, and I'll talk to you today about surgery for the primary tumor and surgery for liver metastases in patients with well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. I got nothing to disclose for this talk. So um, as we probably all know by now, uh, primary tumor resection in uh, neuroendocrine tumors is uh, the only way to actually cure neuroendocrine tumors if the tumor is localized to uh, one area where it started. So for example, if you have a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor that is uh, localized to the small bowel, removing the small bowel is the only way to cure this tumor. Things change a little bit if and when the tumor has spread, for example, to the liver or to lymph nodes that are further up along the uh, mesenteric route. But as a general a reminder, surgery is the only potential curative options for neuroendocrine tumors when they are localized. So when you talk about surgery for a primary neuroendocrine tumor, you also have to talk about potential complications in centers that have a high level of experience with these tumors. The complications are relatively low. So you can see here the complication for stomach or duodenal surgery, pancreatic surgery, colon or small bowel surgery, and uh, liver or gallbladder surgery are relatively low considering the type of surgery that uh, you're going to do. But primary tumor resection in the uh, setting of metastatic disease, that's a different question. And that's often a question that uh, patients have. Is it worth removing the primary tumor when the tumor has spread outside of the vicinity where it started? And here, there are a couple of things that we need to think of. Primarily, uh, one has to think about uh, the fact that resecting the primary tumor when patients are symptomatic uh, which happens most commonly in small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, is definitely something that you would want to do. We generally say that about 25% of patients with metastatic disease run into problems due to their primary tumor, whether it's obstruction, bleeding, perforation. You know, These are the types of things that you really want to consider. And if a patient is symptomatic, so let's say they have cramping after they eat, uh, they have weight loss, you know, they have a blood in their stool, you certainly would want to intervene and remove the primary tumor. On the right side, here's a picture of a surgical specimen where the right colon is labeled here on the right side. And then on the left side, uh, it says SB, which is small bowel, and then a mass. So this was actually a mass from the mesentery of the small bowel that grew into the anterior abdominal wall of the patient and caused a lot of problems, including uh, bowel twisting and blockages. One of the things I think that is important to remember is that elective surgical procedures carry less complication than emergent cases. So the argument to say, well, even though, you know, uh, I am perhaps a little bit symptomatic, but it doesn't really bother me too much, I'll just, you know, wait it out. And if I ever need a surgery, well, then I will need a surgery in the future. Well, that's not a really great argument because often when you do need that surgery, it's more in an emergent uh, setting and the risk of infection and complication is a lot higher. So you're going to want to take care of that primary tumor, especially if it's in a small bowel and it's large and it's causing symptoms. Most patients with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors actually have localized symptoms. Um, often, you know, patients develop these symptoms over years and they almost get used to it and they feel like they don't really have a lot of symptoms uh, due to the tumor. But if you ask them and you do a really detailed history and you compare how you felt like five or 10 years ago to how you feel now, you will notice that quite often patients are symptomatic, even though they may have gotten used to it and they may not really necessarily recognize it. When it comes to PRT, which is a treatment that we often give for metastatic disease, patients that have large mesenteric or abdominal tumors or peritoneal disease can actually experience worsening of their symptoms, especially uh, bowel blockages, due to the fact that some of these tumors can swell after PRT for a while and make the uh, blockage worse. This is one of the reasons why we really want to make sure that the primary tumor ideally is out, especially if it is in the small bowel before we treat patients with PRT. Now, gastric, duodenal, or rarely pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can cause symptoms such as bleeding. Sometimes they also have to be removed uh, because they're symptomatic. 
And generally speaking, when you talk about only removal of a primary tumor, often minimal invasive surgery like robotic or laparoscopic surgeries can be done to remove these tumors. So it's not always a big open surgery that has to be done with a longer recovery time. The big question in a neuroendocrine tumor world that's been debated for many years is whether primary tumors should be resected in asymptomatic patients. And I would say in general, for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, probably yes. Maybe for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that are in the tail, probably not unless they are symptomatic for tumors that are in the head of the pancreas because a Whipple operation is a big operation with a high morbidity, some mortality still um, associated with this. And this is a surgery that patients can uh, have problems with recovering from long-term. So probably if they are asymptomatic and have a tumor in the head of the pancreas, unless it can be enucleated, so carved out, I would say that a Whipple is only necessary in rare cases. Now, when we talk about resection of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, for example, you know, this is an example of a patient that has, you know, a lot of metastatic disease on the left-hand side in the liver, too much to actually resect surgically, but has this large mass in the mesentery here where the red arrow points to. And again, this is a good example of a patient that even if they are asymptomatic, you would want to remove this because you expect that because of the metastatic disease, these patients will require PRT down the line, and that will be a problem, and these patients are at high risk of blockages. I and multiple um, other groups have looked at this and published multiple papers over the years about resection of primary tumors in patients that are asymptomatic, so without symptoms. And even there, with pancreatic and small bowel neuroendocrine tumors as seen in these charts, you can say that generally these patients tend to live uh, longer and do better if the primary tumor was removed. Now, why that is, we don't know, because again, these patients are asymptomatic. Is it because they develop less complications down the line? Perhaps. Is it because there's less tumor shedding from the primary tumor to the liver, and therefore the progression in the liver is slower? Perhaps. We don't really know that, but these are all studies that have looked at some of these possibilities. And although we don't have a clear conclusion, these are some of the theories we work with. This is a study here from a group on the West Coast at uh, City of Hope. And here again, they showed that whether you treated liver or didn't treat the liver, removing of the primary tumor made a difference in terms of long-term survival. Again, why that is, we don't really know, but certainly something that we should consider in patients, even if they are asymptomatic. And then there's this paper that came out four years ago now that showed that if you remove the primary tumor and you give patients PRT, they tend to do better in terms of long-term progression-free survival. Why that is, again, we don't know, but certainly it's true against pancreas, small bowel, and lung neuroendocrine tumors, so certainly something that is worth exploring further, and uh, which is why, um, again, removal of primary tumor, even if they are asymptomatic, at least in the small bowel and maybe in the tail of the pancreas, should be considered. Now, sometimes we talk about root of the mesentery lymph nodes, so these are tumors that have uh, masses, as you can see on the right-hand side, at the root of the mesentery. So uh, this is the area where the blood vessels come and supply your small and large bowel. It's way up there compared to generally the small bowel primary tumors, as in yellow here in the small bowel, and then most of the lymph node metastases are closer to that area. So that's easily resectable, the blue and the yellow dot. But the black dot often is unresectable because if we damage these vessels all the way high up there, you know, we lose blood supply to the entire small bowel. So, you know, in patients that have root of the mesenteric uh, lymph nodes, the question is whether it is still worth resecting the small bowel primary and the um, adjacent mesenteric lymph nodes as seen in the blue circle here. And generally the consensus is then yes, it is worth doing that. The nodes around the root of the mesentery can progress over time, can even cause damage to the blood vessels and therefore have certain segment of the small bowel appear less healthy and cause problems. Again, sometimes resecting those segments of small bowel may help with the symptoms. And root of the mesenteric lymph nodes almost always happen with uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumor primary tumors. They are generally uh, considered unresectable when they are at the root, as I said, and growth of the black dot here, so the root of the mesentery should be uh, most of the time controlled with other means such as octreotide or PRT. But again, primary tumor or metastatic disease resection can be considered even if they are root of the mesenteric lymph nodes in selected cases. Now, switching gears and talking about metastatic neuroendocrine tumor for the next eight minutes or so. So metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, 
wherever the primer is, the most common site of metastasis is the liver. As you know, liver tumor burden, as seen in the right graph here, is an important factor for long-term survival. So the higher the tumor burden, the closer you are that the liver can't take more tumor before it stops failing. So you really want to try to control that liver tumor burden throughout the years as much as possible. Treatment options for metastatic disease are and will be and have been discussed throughout this conference. There are systemic therapies and then liver-directed therapies. We rarely do liver transplant, but certainly liver-directed therapies with interventional radiology or with surgical resection or debulking is uh, something that you are going to hear throughout this conference. This is a paper that I often present every year, but again, it's still, even though it was published almost uh, five years ago, very relevant is that most of the studies that have been done for systemic therapies like PRT, lanreotide, everolimus, and sunitinib have never specifically uh, looked at how these therapies do on uh, liver metastases in particular, and we definitely need more data. And uh, therefore, I think that surgery to debug liver metastases are still uh, a very important part of the treatment um, algorithm for neuroendocrine tumors. So why surgery for liver metastases, where surgery is the only potential for cure, although that's very rare. Usually when you cure patients that have liver metastases, they have a very limited amount of neuronal tumor liver metastases, maybe one or two. And those were just the only deposits that uh, the tumor had time to shed and therefore resect them would potentially cure you. Uh, but most of the time it's much more disease than that. And therefore we don't cure patients, but we reset the time clock and often give them a survival advantage over no surgery. One can achieve major tumor burden removal. Remember, liver tumor burden associated with prognosis, and you know we can remove a lot of tumor burden and make the liver almost tumor-free. Complications are much decreased with newer techniques, and surgery may make systemic therapies better, such as uh, the paper I showed you about PRT, primary tumor resection, and potentially even additional therapy like liver-directed therapy and PRT may, may work better with smaller amount of disease than large amount of bulky uh, liver disease. Now, when it comes to progression-free survival and overall survival, these are retrospective studies, but they did show that if you debulk more than 90% or even in some studies up to 70% of uh, the tumor burden, your survival is better long-term. It does not matter how many lesions there are really, it's more about the percentage debulking. Even patients that have extra hepatic metastases, so let's say bone metastases, or like I said before, root of the mesenteric lymph node metastases, can benefit from liver debulking, as you can see here in the black graph compared to the blue graph. You know, patients still lived longer if they had liver debulking, and the green curve is the one that didn't have extra hepatic metastases. So is it worth going through this big operation of liver debulking? Um, it depends on many things. I would say tumor biology. Biology is king, right? We want to make sure we select the right patients where the tumor is not growing too fast and too much. We want to make sure that the surgeon is experienced in doing these procedures and also set the expectation right. As I said, this is rarely curative. This is a, a poster we presented at the AES last year with our own series of uh, roughly 50 patients um, over a year and a half or so that we operated on. And again, this looks at whether liver debulking surgery is safe in our hands, and it is. The major complication rate was less than 20%. Uh, most of the complications were low platelets or low blood counts due to a little bit of blood loss during surgery, which you know is expected. And whether we debulked a few tumors or more than 15 in terms of progression-free survival, it didn't make a difference. And importantly, what we show in this paper is that none of the patients after liver debulking had liver failure. So everybody's liver recovered well and did well long-term. This is just a, a few scans showing how things look pre-op and post-op at 3 and 15 months in small bowel and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors after liver debulking. Now, when not to operate is also an important question, right? If you have a lot of tumor, like on the left-hand side here, you know, too much, more than 25 or 50%, too much to actually debulk well uh, and reach those thresholds that you want, that's not a good candidate. Innumerable, really tiny metastases, too small for us to detect in the liver is also not a good candidate. Carcinoid heart disease may have to be fixed prior to a liver surgery. If you have major blockages of your vessel supplying, your liver, like a portal vein thrombus, also not a good candidate. And obviously, you got to have a good performance status and a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor to be a candidate for liver debulking. We look at inflow and outflow of the hepatic veins, the arteries, 
and a portal vein here into the liver. The black dots are representative of some tumors. And then we select preoperatively how we're going to resect them. And again, we usually do parenchymal sparing resection. So we carve them out one by one. Rarely is it that we have to take bigger pieces of the liver. This, for example, is an example of a of a huge tumor on the right side. This will obviously require a right hepatectomy, but again, most of the time, there are more smaller tumors that are more distributed throughout uh, both lobes of the liver. So the way we do this is with parenchymal sparing resections, as you can see here in the video, and microwave ablation that are targeted, seen on the left side here. So you end up with a liver full of holes, so to speak, but again, we don't compromise the um, architecture of the liver, the inflow and outflow of the liver. We just carve these lesions out one by one. So this is a paper that we published a couple of months ago where it shows sort of a traditional uh, decision tree, how we uh, look at our pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patients, for example, at the University of Chicago. Obviously, if we can do complete resection, we'll do it on the left-hand side. And then if we don't, We'll look at whether there is limited liver disease involved, whether people are stable on oxyotide for a while, especially for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, therefore whether they are good candidates for surgical debulking. And then if not, or if later on they progress again, all these additional therapies like CAPTEM, PRT, oxyotide, et cetera, play into the therapeutic scheme of our patients. So in conclusions, I would say that surgery for localized neuroendocrine tumors is on, it's the only curative treatment, and the risk of surgery definitely outweigh the benefits in almost all cases. But surgery for the primary tumor, the unresectable distant disease, should be considered for symptomatic primary tumor or selectively in other cases, especially for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Surgical debulking of liver metastases with resection of primary tumor is usually not curative, but has been improved with long-term survival and symptom control. And it's also safe, as we and um, other groups have shown. Surgical debulking may increase efficacies of local and systemic therapies like PRT or Blanembo. And I hope that you uh, learned something throughout this talk. If you have any questions in the future, please reach out to me directly. And again, thank you very much for being here today. And I hope that you have a great uh, rest of your session. Thank you.